Hi kids, it's Mrs. Frable. How are you? Good. I'm glad. Me too. Hey, uh, today we are going to dive into, <laughs> I'm, I'm never going to get sick of saying that. We're going to talk about uh, what animals actually create coral reefs. Um, so last time you should have uh, watched my video presentation because you watch all of these videos because they're, they're great. Uh, and you should have done the associated assignment for last time, the, the what is a coral reef reading, and watch the video um, that goes with that, okay? So today we're going to talk about the actual animals, but first, um, again, you are following directions, you're going to all of the right places, so you're following the module or following the uh, instructions page, and you should have already done a starter question on the discussion section um, in the module. Okay, so uh, I'm going to go through the answers with you. Describe two abiotic factors or parameters requirements for coral reefs. Um, you should have listed two of these things and describe them. Corals need a depth shallower than 27 meters. They need moderate light. The pH between 8.0 and 8.3. Temperature between 70 to 80, 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, 29 degrees is their upper on Celsius. Uh, salinity should be average, but they adapt to local salin salinities. And low turbidity. They need to be able to get the sunlight through the water. Okay. And then um, last week, I don't know if you guys noticed, giant, beautiful, glowing, full moon all night long. It woke me up a couple times. It's so bright coming in my window. Um, what, what did the coast see? in terms of their tides. What kind of tide was it and why? You should have gotten the spring tide. So the spring tide was last week. That is the highest high tide and the lowest low tide of the month because the sun and the moon positions on opposite sides of the planet are pulling that water in greater, um, greater f distances. That makes sense. You, okay, here we go. It's the end of the day. I'm okay, but my mouth might not be connected to my brain the whole time I'm making this video. So just, you know, that's fine. This is fine. All right, let's talk about corals, shall we? Uh, specifically, I'm going to go into the science and the physiology behind uh, the group of animals taxonomically that corals fit into, which is phylum Nidaria, and if that word phylum is not familiar to you, just remember in classification when we group animals by their physical characteristics, we go kingdom, animalia, and then phylum, right? Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Remember that? Okay, good. So they belong in this group called phylum Nidaria. The C is silent because it's Greek. And these, this group includes not just corals, it's also animals called siphonophores, which are colonial, free-swimming animals, floating animals, but they're made of colonies of separate clones. Um, jellies, like sea jellies, jellyfish, uh, corals, and anemones. So I'm going to talk about mainly corals today. We'll talk about jellies and siphonophores a little more when we get into the pelagic ocean. Um, so this is a, a beautiful jelly. I think that's a sea nettle. I could be wrong. Uh, this is a floating, free-floating siphonophore. These are actually some of the longest animals in the world. This is a coral. This is um, one of my corals. It's a dragon's eye zoa. Is that one of mine? Maybe. And this is an anemone, okay? All right, so what are corals? They belong to the phylum Cnidaria because they have these physical characteristics. They have radial symmetry. That means if you cut their body, you can cut their body into like a pie and each pie slice will be identical. So you have bilateral symmetry where you can cut yourself in half and you have two mirrored sides, radially symmetrical animals have that, but in pie slices. So these guys have um, a mouth in the center of a disc on their body and they have a tentacle surrounding that, okay? And again, you can slice them like a pie. 
They have uh, two tissue layers. They do not have any organs. They have an epidermis that covers the outside of their body, and they have a gastrodermis that lines the inside of their body cavity. Uh, they have a goo between those two layers called mesoglea. Uh, nematocysts, these are stinging cells, and I... Um, there's a there's a video on nematocysts that I'll show you when we talk about jellies, but essentially they have these cells on their tentacles that uh, have a tiny microscopic poisonous harpoon in them. Have you, if you've ever been um, scuba diving or snorkeling and you came away with a rash from brushing up against coral, that's what you got. You got stung uh, a, a ton of times, um, just little tiny poisonous nematocysts. Sometimes those can be very toxic, so always be careful when you're diving. Don't touch reefs. It's bad for the reefs and sometimes toxic for you, okay? Um, the, they also use those for not just defense, but they also use them to stun prey, okay? Uh, I watched it happen. I watched my coral tried to eat one of my, one of my fish one day in my tank. All right, so their digestive system is incomplete. These guys have a sac-like body, they have a mouth on one top side, and I could be showing you this instead of trying to pantomime it, okay? So this is a model of a coral body, okay? So um, the top of their, what we call their oral surface, they have this mouth opening. That's also their anal opening. Sometimes it's called a manus, um, not really, but they, Inside, they have just these two, gosh, I hope you can see it. The light is kind of weird. There we go. So they have two layers of cells. They've got their um, epidermis and their gastrodermis, right? And then inside their, their gastrovascular cavity, that's where everything happens. All of their digestion, all of their gas exchange, um, and all of their uh, um, reproduction their gamete release comes out of that one opening, the mouth anus or the manus, okay? Um, they have a very primitive, loosely connected nerve net. So they have nerves to kind of coordinate some movement. Corals can move, um, but they don't have a brain. And they have light sensing cells. Not all corals do, but some of them have um, photoreceptive cells on their tentacles. Uh, but they don't have eyes. They can essentially sense light and dark. There are some jellies that can sense, um, that can see like shadowy light changes and movement. Um, but corals pretty much just know uh, time to be open, time to be closed, depending on light and dark. Okay? Okay. Make sure you know what uh, makes a cnidarian a cnidarian. And then specifically, we're going to talk into. Um, I don't know why that doubled, sorry. Then we're gonna talk more about corals in a sec. So the basic body plan for this phylum, for the group, they come in two different forms. There are medusal cnidarians, and those are the jellies, okay? And they're also uh, corals as, as babies, as kind of almost as larvae, okay? So the medusa form of a cnidarian these are the ones that have a bell on the top. Then they have tentacles that hang down. These are free swimming animals. Their mouth is tucked up in between their, um, in the middle of their oral surface in their tentacles, okay? And then the other body form is called a polyp. And uh, jellies actually start as a polyp and then they pop off and become medusa. But corals and anemones are always forever as adults. They're in the polyp form. So they are attached. They've got a foot at the bottom called a pedicel. And then they have, uh, and sometimes that pedicel is inside of a, uh, inside of a bony skeleton cup where they can kind of retract down into it. And then they've just got this soft, squishy body, okay? And they have their mouth on the oral surface side. You can see their, um, their soft body as well. Here's how, here's how you're gonna remember 
the two body forms for cnidarians because this is something that you need to be able to identify on the test okay everybody i don't care if i can't see you right now hold up your hand like this okay oh there's an announcement hold on Jody, I could you contact the main office at 66402? Jody, I please call the main office at 66402. Hope Jody got her phone call. Okay. Your hand is the body of your nidarian. Oh, sorry. This is your oral surface. So imagine that there's a mouth in the middle of your palm. Your fingers are your tentacles. So if you are a Medusa, tentacles, mouth, and these are free swimming, okay? Medusa, hold your hand like this, wiggle your tentacles, say Medusa. Good, bloop, bloop. Okay. The other form, the polyp, you're gonna take your body, your hand, and hold it like this. Again, there's a mouth in the middle of your palm. These are your poisonous tentacles. This is a polyp, okay? Medusa, polyp. Everybody hold your hand like this. Do it, come on. Okay, wiggle your tentacles and say polyp. Good. What's this one? Bloop, bloop. Good. What's this one? Good. Okay. I do make you do that in class live. It's one of my favorite things. Okay. So let's talk about corals in particular. They belong to the class Anthozoa. And um, this includes these, these polyp form cnidarians. So anemones and corals are both class anthozoa, kingdom phylum class, okay? Uh, these guys are, uh, they have no, or they have a very, very short medusal stage um, as larvae, but sometimes they don't have a, a medusal stage at all. These guys are sessile and benthic. Oh gosh, by the way, I always just assume that you guys are taking notes because you are good students, but let, let me just make sure you should be taking notes and you should be writing down the underlined stuff. Uh, if you need to restart this video to take notes, you should. I think I'll have you upload your notes as an assignment because that way you'll watch this video. I'm brilliant. I'm going to do that. Okay. You should be taking notes. So Cladosanthozoa includes all anemones and corals. They are uh, predominantly uh, in a polyp phase all the time. They are sessile and benthic. There's some vocabulary words for you. Sessile means they don't move. Benthic means uh, that they are attached to the bottom seafloor, right? We talked about the, the benthic zones in the ocean. This is where corals and anemones are. They're attached to the bottom. Um, the sessile thing, meh, some of them can walk. And I will, um, I'll try to show you a video of my anemone walking, okay? Um, and then these guys have what's called a symbiotic relationship with algae that live in their mesodermic mesoglia tissue in their goo. This is what gives them their color. Uh, their bodies are actually transparent. They're clear gel. And the only way that we get that amazing color from corals is due to the algae that lives in their, their tissue symbiotically. So there are two videos over here. I'm going to link them in the assignment page under this video. So you should watch them and also take notes from them. Um, and there's a time-lapse coral video of them moving. Let's see if we can, will that come up? I don't know, let's take a look. Okay, this is, good, it's working. So that is not a coral, that's a tube worm. It just happens to be on this video. So this is macro uh, time-lapse video of ocean animals that we may not perceive as moving much. Okay, so slow life. So uh, this is a coral. And during the day, this is what this coral looks like. But at night, when it's hunting, it blooms. And these are those individual polyps. So corals are colonial animals. They're colonial polyps, and they reproduce mainly by dividing in half and making a new polyp. So this is the close-up oral surface of a coral. Look how cute it is. There's this little mouse. 
but you can see those tissues moving, twitching. These are the tentacles and they can actually move enough to get themselves out from under sediment if they have to. Uh, it uses a lot of energy for them, but essentially they poof their bodies up with water and then down and poof it up with water and knock all that sediment off. Okay. Look how lovely they are. Look at those cool old men. Those colors are all just algae inside of the coral body. You can see this animal move and respond. And eat. So those are the tentacles there. And the mouth. With the meatiness. Uh, that is, I don't think that's a sponge. I don't think that's a coral mouth. Maybe. Okay. I think you did it, right? Oh, just so you can see how slow it is. See all the little zoomy things? Those are worms and shrimp running all over. So that's just how slow these guys move. Everything else is zooming around. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. That's, okay. that's a sponge. Okay. I'm, I'm, we'll talk about sponges too, um, probably soon. Okay. Yeah. That was nice. I love that. So make sure that you know that symbiotic algae and the name of it, here we go with another great big awesome word, zoaxanthellae. Zoaxanthellae. That is the algae that lives inside of coral and anemone bodies. Some jellies also have them. Um, and that's what, again, that's all, that's what gives them their color. Other than that, they are completely, if you can see over here, they're completely transparent. They're made of goo. Um, they have a mutualistic relationship uh, together, we talked about those symbioses uh, in ecology. And the coral provide the algae with a protected environment, right? They're inside of the coral's body, so they're not going to be grazed on um, by, by algae-eating animals like snails, okay? Uh, and in return, even more importantly, those zoaxanthellae provide the uh, oxygen and sugars to the corals. Um, so as those zoaxanthellae, as those algae are doing photosynthesis, right, they're going to share their oxygen byproduct with this animal that needs oxygen. And they're also going to provide some of their sugars as well to the corals, okay, um, and other metabolic compounds. So corals do need to eat, but um, during the day, generally, uh, they don't actively hunt, which means they don't actively have their tentacles searching for food. They, they, have, they can have what's called a sweeper tentacle, and that will come out at night, because at night, their um, zoaxanthellae are doing um, dark phase photosynthesis. That's when they're constructing sugars and stuff. So um, the, the algae or the, the corals have to kind of actively find food. It's, it's really pretty cool. Um, I'll... I've got videos of, of that, of sweeper tentacles. Um, my I've got one coral in my tank who its sweeper tentacles will come out this far. Um, he tries to grab my fish all the time. It's super. Uh, but during the day, that algae feeds the coral, okay? Uh, this algae is one of the most important primary producers in the coral reef. Uh, corals are, are predated upon. They are eaten by things and they have some defenses. Uh, but that algae produces a lot of the oxygen in the ocean and in our atmosphere as well. Okay. Uh, so corals get their sugars from their zooxanthellae, um, and they, the zooxanthellae also help them process the calcium carbonate that makes their skeleton. So that's what a coral reef is made of. It's made of the skeletons of stony corals, and I'll talk about those in a sec. They also will ingest plankton, whatever's floating in the water. They keep that mouth open. Um, anything that lands in their tentacles, they will stick in their mouth. It's really kind of cute to watch them eat. All right. There are two major types of coral. There are stony corals and there are soft corals. So stony corals are the ones that build reefs. They have a skeleton of calcium carbonate that surrounds their soft body, okay? So we call that the calyx. So in my little model, this is the calyx, right? 
And I mean, they're soft body. It depends, it depends on the species and the genus of corals. Some of them have a really deep calyx. Some of them just kind of sit on top of their calyx. Um, but that calyx is what they use for support and for anchorage. And again, it builds reefs. So um, as each individual polyp grows, it is making a little cup for itself. It makes that calyx, okay? So I don't know if you can see, see if we were in class, you guys, yeah, I would be passing these around. Hope we come back soon so you can play with my corals and things. Okay, so I don't know if you guys can see, but this, this coral um, is covered with little tiny holes or little tiny dents. Those were each a separate coral polyp, okay? So this is a small, polyp stony coral. They come in large or small polyp forms. Um, let's see, this is a skeleton from a large polyp stony coral. So each of these circles had a, had a coral body sitting in it. Um, they, they have this, this particular variety. Uh, they don't really stick up like that. They're more of like a mushroom looking coral. Um, and I'm just going to be upfront and honest, I'm horrible with remembering coral species names. Terrible at it. I do not know why. I should know the name of this coral. I do not. I used to know the name of this coral. And right now, because I have to tell it to you, my brain can't get it. Mm -mm. Starts with an A. Anyway, um, this is staghorn coral again. Stony, small polyp. If you see tiny spot, tiny little holes, that's a small polyp stony coral. If you see larger ones, these, those are large polyp stony corals, okay? Okay, what else do I have? I have so many cool things. This is a large polyp stony coral there. And then we do have some corals. Oh, this one's cool too. Okay, hold on. This is a, I don't know if that's a large or a small, but they're, they're very pretty. Okay. So those are all colonial corals. So each one of those little bodies is a genetic clone of all of them. They start as one polyp. And then that polyp just starts asexually dividing to make more. And then we also get um, non-colonial um, corals that live just one, one or two or three polyps together um, by themselves. Okay, and this was a mushroom coral. Very pretty. Okay. All right. As each of them die, they leave behind their old skeletons and new generations of coral will grow on the old coral skeletons. And that's how we get these meters and meters of limestone in the coral reefs. Okay. Okay. So there are lots of different morphologies or body types for stony corals. We get the branching ones, like I showed you. We get plate corals as well. And I... I do not have a plate coral. I've got one in my tank at home trying to die, so maybe, maybe. Um, but that's here. We've got that plate style, so I can get out of the way. Plate corals. We have encrusting coral. Now, I do know this one's name. This is Cyphestra. I have this in my tank as well. Um, this is a small polyp stony coral that encrusts around on whatever it is living on. Um, and you can see that this isn't mine. But whoever grew this cyphaster, they put it on a, one of the little ceramic skulls, like the, the, the Day of the Dead skulls, um, and it just took that shape. They're, they're, really, they're really pretty cool. And then um, we also have columnar. I think that that's elkhorn or pipe organ cor coral. And then we have the free living ones, and we have these like brain type ones. So there is a huge diversity. This group of animals has been around for hundreds of millions of years and have weathered every mass extinction event so far on the planet, which has been five. Um, and they've managed to survive every single one. Um, they're amazing. I love them. Okay. So again, we have plate-like. We also have what's called foliaceous, where they 
the 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 the, the polyps start to form this like curly flower looking one um, again free living brain type or what's called a massive coral branching columnar they're just you guys they're just i love them okay so that's stony corals soft corals are called al alcyonations alcyonations so these guys don't have stony skeletons they are they're more like um anemones they're soft squishy bodies with no skeleton uh, and they actually can walk a little bit on their little pedestal pedestal um, and they hold on to the substrate with that foot it's like a suction cup and their bodies do have a little bit of support they'll have like little tiny spicules uh, called sclerites just to keep them upright so that they're not just like a jellyfish just like bleh. these guys have a little support in their um, calyx or in their foot and their pedestal so that they have some some um, support whew, whew, my brain is so excited about coral. <laughs> there are different body types and morphologies for soft corals as well we get bubble corals we get what's called sea fans these are gorgonians now I the gorgonians are kind of their own thing they're they're kind of coral they're also not so but they're really pretty gosh they look like Dr. Seuss trees. They really do. Okay? And then we have leather corals, mushroom corals. There are tree-like ones. I've got one species um, in my tank called pulsing xenia, and I tried to get a video of it in here and I just PowerPoint wouldn't let it go on. So I think I'll do a video next week of um, Mrs. Frable showing off her tank. I'm, I'm gonna Gilderoy Lockhart you guys with my corals okay uh but the pulsing xenia it actually actively pumps really fast it pulses it has little hands uh each polyp goes like this and you get a whole colony of them of hundreds of them going like this hopefully mine will be pulsing next week okay and then zoanthid those are uh the beautiful little individual they look like eyes and they are all soft okay i've got a couple of those Whew. Okay, you just learned a whole lot about coral physiology and taxonomy. Whew, all right, let's talk about the reefs. So I took you on a little dive the other day of the part of the Great Barrier Reef. Okay? So the Great Barrier Reef and coral reefs, as you saw in your video for your last assignment, coral reefs um, are prevalent in the shallow seas in between uh, so in the latitudes surrounding the equator right uh, so mainly warmer tropical waters and uh, that's where our stony corals mainly are the largest barrier reef um, and they they form what's called barriers uh, barrier reefs protect shorelines of um, continents and islands so the great barrier reef of australia is the largest and it stretches over 2300 kilometers long you can see it from outer space and it covers an area 334,000 square kilometers so not only is it long it's wide and it kind of tapers um, it's located in the Coral Sea, where most corals in the world are found, off the coast of Queensland, Australia. Uh, there's thousands of species of coral. There's um, table bringing pipe corals, flower pot corals, cauliflower corals. I have a cauliflower, I have a cauliflower coral right there. I got that. I got this in Hawaii. They wash up on the beach. Okay. Don't tell the people in Hawaii that I took that. It was for educational reasons. Okay. Um, and then that reef supports, these reefs support the, some of the most important and diverse communities in the world in terms of animal life. They are nurseries for a lot of open ocean fish. Their fish larvae actually grow up in the coral reef because they can hide and they're safe. Same with octopus, cuttlefish, squid, seahorses, all kinds of fish also call that call these reefs their permanent home. So we get tangs, anemone fish, of course, coral trout, groupers, octopus, all of them. Sea turtles hang out in coral reefs all the time. Um, all kinds of echinoderms like starfish, 
uh, and uh, sea cucumbers. We get all kinds of mollusks, clams, snails, nudibranchs, sea snakes hang out in coral reefs in uh, the Great Barrier Reef in particular. Sea snakes are only found uh, in the Indonesian and coral seas. Okay? okay, so there's a little bit about the Great Barrier Reef. Again, this is literally one of the most important ecosystems on the planet. And right now it's not doing so hot. I don't know if you know that. Next week we're going to uh, talk about some of the threats to the Great Barrier Reef and all of our reefs. Okay. okay. Any questions? Oh, what was your assignment? Good question. Your assignment, you're going to make a slideshow. Now don't panic. You have a whole week to get this done. Okay. Uh, you're going to make a slideshow on Google Slides. And this description is also on... Uh, the assignment page for it on Canvas. So um, I'll probably post this video right above it. Uh, don't, so don't stop the video yet though, okay? So you're gonna make a slideshow on Google Slides and you are going to showcase a different species and a different type of coral on each slide. So you need to have one slide showcasing a large polyp stony species, one and then another slide with a small polyp stony species, a slide with an anemone that lives in coral reefs, the purple stemmed anemone is my favorite, uh, and then two other soft corals. The easiest way to do this research, although I'm sure I don't need to tell you guys this because you grew up doing the internet, right? When you're researching uh, stuff like this, uh, Wikipedia is actually a good source on um, on zoo zoology stuff and marine biology stuff. So um, you can Google large polyp stony coral, okay? Um, and don't, don't panic too much because you're gonna start Googling these and what you're gonna, the first hits you're always gonna get are going to be people selling corals. So uh, as long as they have the scientific information about them on there, that's, that's fine to use as a source. Just don't buy them unless you have a reef tank or want to buy Mrs. Frable a coral for her reef tank. No, don't buy me coral. I'm fine. Mine's full. Okay. So you're going to have one, two, three, four, five different species of coral. For each of those, I want its common name and scientific name. If it doesn't have a common name, that's fine. Not all, not all corals have common names. So you can just do the genus and species. Uh, I want a picture and a written description of them. And uh, tell me where they're found in the wild. Don't tell me that Bob's, Bob's Reef Village in Cincinnati, Ohio will sell you one. Tell me where they're found in the wild, okay? Um, and then for your sixth slide, I want you to research a reef other than the barrier reef. So I just told you about the Great Barrier Reef off of Australia. You can look up a coral reef somewhere else. There's the... Um, coral reef off the coast of um, Belize, that's the Caribbean reef, that's the second largest coral reef in the world. There's also reefs um, all around Indonesia, and those Indonesian reefs are some of the most pristine reefs in the world. There's reefs in the Caribbean, there's actually um, a recently discovered reef at the mouth of uh, the Amazon River. We didn't know it was there. There are reefs in the Red Sea, off of Africa. They're everywhere. Find a cool one, okay? I want you to tell me what uh, it looks, see if you can find a picture of it. I'm sure there's pictures. And tell me a brief description of the ecosystem, a, a sampling what kind of corals are found there, what kinds of fish and other organisms, and then also tell me how humans impact it, whether we use it for tourism and diving, or if there is an industrial uh, effect to it? Is there a shipbuilding yard? Is there a giant city like Rio de Janeiro flushing its toilets into it? Things like that. Okay. All right. Any questions? Okay. Uh, have a great fall break. Uh, this is due next Wednesday, so you don't necessarily have to work on it over fall break. Um, Wednesday the 21st is when I want this turned in. Okay. Okay. You guys are awesome. I hope to see you soon so you can play with my corals. Okay. Be good, wear your masks. Bye.